since the very beginning since we launched, we've always tried to be advocates for issues that matter and try to facilitate a dialogue in the industry about things that we should all care about. And this is one of those examples. Um, we may not all agree about what makes markets better, but I think we all want that. And as long as we can have an open and constructive dialogue and learn from it and also fix things that are not right, I think we'll all be better off. So I have the pleasure here to introduce Dr. Sean Foley. Um, he's with us here from the University of Sydney. And believe it or not, he's an Australian expert on Canadian market structure. <laughs> he's here to walk you through one of his papers called The Value of a Millisecond which really examines some of the things that have happened here in the last 12 months uh, with the launch of Alpha and how that has affected the Canadian market. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Sean. Thank you for coming. Thanks, appreciate it. So thanks for having me. Uh, I've been to Canada a lot. I've been to Toronto uh, when I was doing my PhD, and uh, I really enjoy coming back, especially when I get up into a paper. But, um, so this is a joint work I've done with one of my PhD students, Tommy Chen, and uh, a couple of other guys that I know. Um, so I guess the focus of this is looking at the introduction of speed bumping to Alpha and how it's impacted Canadian markets and whether we should be concerned, happy, sad. Um, so what is this speed bump? I would think we need one. I'm going to give you the line that I think uh, you might be familiar with if you read Flash Boys. So uh, you know the language of modern capital markets is really fast now, right? I mean we're measuring everything in milliseconds. I was talking to a bloke from Optima who heads Asia Pacific, and I said, how long does it take if you get from uh, Singapore to to Japan uh, to trade his index stuff, right? And he said, oh, it's a secret concept. I said, okay, cool, but uh, you know, how long would a packet take? It's like 50 milliseconds. I was like, how, how long would light take? It's like 20 milliseconds. I was like, okay, cool. So between 20 and 50 then is where he's at, right? So we're moving to this idea of everything's really fast. And then, you know, it takes you 300 milliseconds to blink your eyes. So to give you a conception of the fact that I can get a signal from Japan to uh, Singapore and back uh, quicker than you can blink your eyes, like that's pretty fast, right? Um, so we have this problem, and I'm going to present it purposely with US stuff to start, and then we'll move to Canadian because there's a bit of a difference, and that's maybe what's important. So, you know, in modern markets, the pretty fragmented across venues, you guys are all brokers, you know this, right? So you've got the pretty sitting somewhere, some of the rest of the pretty is HFT, some's not. Um, and you're, you're this, this attractive man here, right? You may be women, sorry, maybe you should get a man and a woman, but um, you're trying to hit the liquidity, right? Like you want to take out the offers or like 10, 10. And so uh, you face this issue, right, that it's fragmented, you need to smart order around it, you need to figure out how you can send it. So one of the problems that you may face is you go and you hit the first 3,000 on NASDAQ, and as soon as you do, some sneaky guy has a bloody microwave tower from market to wherever, right, and he knows that you're trying to maybe hit the rest of the liquidity that's resting on the other venues. These happen to be his orders in green. So what does he do? Or maybe he just goes and races you there and cancels them. What are the impacts of this? Well, one, you receive a low fill rate. You wanted to catch those 6,000 trades or shares, and now you only capture 3,000, right? So you get a shortfall. Maybe two, you still really need a trade, right? So like you had to get 6,000, so what do you do? Well, you send market orders, they just hit the next level, right? So now you're paying an extra stand on 3,000. I mean, it's only three bucks or whatever, 30 bucks, who cares, right? Well, probably you would suspect. Um, especially if it happens every day, all day, right? So uh, IDX came up with a solution which, you know, Flash Boys really presented as like, hey, speed bumps are awesome. Guys, this is the solution. And I think it might be in some ways. It depends on how you structure it. So what they said is, okay, let's imagine that I am in Cuba and I need to send a postcard to my dad in Sydney and to my fiance's mom in Russia. We actually did this, right? And so we send it, I send it, and my dad gets it after three weeks, and her mom gets it after six weeks. The push to Rossi is really bad, right? So if I'd known, let's say we wanted to announce our wedding or something like that, right? If I'd known how long it would take to get to Russia, what I could have done is something similar to what RBC4 does, which is to send my postcard to um, Australia three weeks after I send the postcard to Russia, right? Now they should hit at the same time. So this would be one potential solution, right? And so if everybody faces, sorry, this is scrolling a little bit. If everybody faces a fixed delay, i.e. like we've got a shoebox, right? Everything that comes in, everything that goes out, faces this fixed delay, then it's cool, I know how to deal with it, right? I just send my order here 
first, let's say one millisecond, whatever the speed bump is, I send it first to the shoebox, then one millisecond later, I send it to NASDAQ. Now the two orders should hit contemporaneously. Even once he sees, let's say that there's random jitter in the internet, which is the main problem. If there's random jitter in the internet and he sees that I'm going to trade everything at NASDAQ, as soon as he gets that signal, he sends his cancel order in green, right, into the shoebox. But anyway, I sent my postcard early. So it doesn't matter that he sends his, because it's going to be behind mine. So now, I at least get filled on both venues. Right? And this is a really, I don't know, I, I, I'm going to say it's an easy story to sell. Maybe it's not, because it did take him a whole book, right? But to me, this seems like a kind of easy story to sell. Like, I can show you why. Maybe I still get cancelled over on IC, but I'm able to capture the liquidity that I was unable to capture before. This is a speed bump that's fixed. This is a speed bump that's applied to everyone. Okay, so now we have, well, I have a really nice experiment, right? Alpha made a new speed bump in Canada. What are the details of them? Are all speed bumps created equal? Kind of maybe not, right? So they launched in 2015, more than a year ago now, which is cool because I can show you pictures after the year. Um, the speed bumps randomized between one and three milliseconds for all orders except for post only orders. Now you say, maybe not because your broker's right, but like, what's a post only order? Well, a post only order is a limit order which is unable to remove liquidity. If it hits the market as a limit order and it's marketable, it'll cancel. It's kind of like the opposite of fill or kill. Fill or kill says, take me there. If you can't get it, don't try anything else. Don't keep going, right? Don't become a limit order. This says become a limit order. If you can't become a, if you, if by becoming a limit order, you become a market order, then yeah, I'm not interested, right? So these orders will only ever supply liquidity. So they're for market makers, right? That's the they also did a few other things. They converted the make and take of pricing. So before, I used to get paid a rebate, just like all the other exchanges. Now, they'll, I have to pay to post. And you're thinking like, hang on, I'm a market maker and I have to pay to post? Like, why do I want to pay to post? Well, we'll get to that. Okay. Um, they also said that you have to do 500 share minimum, five, five more level minimum. So, what did you guys say? Well, some of you guys, I reckon maybe Doug wrote that one. You know, this is going to allow passive post only resting orders the ability to fetch. Let's let's see trading on that venue. These guys from TD, you know, they said it's going to make it more difficult to access liquidity at depth and aggregate quote fake across all markets. What does Scotia say? Scotia said often shares will be withdrawn from the market as soon as the order begins to execute, i.e., liquidity fake. So, you know, it seems like people had an inkling, and I was like, I was really excited when I read this. I was like, great, cool, let's see what happened, right? And so that's my job because I'm in the crisis. So I go and get data and I figure stuff out. So, boring, don't worry, only one slide. So what do I do? Okay, so I need to have a methodology. So what I need to do is I'm gonna look at pre-post what happened, basically is what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna look at some standard, in, in my industry, standard market quality measures. So the MBO quoted spread, so like how tight is the quoted spread? What's the debt available that I can hit? What are the effects you realize over selection costs that people face, right? So realize spreads like, what I'm, what I'm earning as a market maker effectively spreads what I pay when I consume liquidity. And adverse selection is like how often the market moves against me when I trade and I didn't want it. Um, I'm going to build some new metrics which I think are really cool and it seems it's starting to seem, and I'm really happy about that, that uh, academics are kind of excited about them too. So um, I, I think that's it's good for me and my job. Um, so I'm going to look at the depleted order book. So I'm going to look at sort of instantaneous order costs. What do I mean by depleted order book? I mean like at the end of you trading, there was no liquidity left at the price level that you were hitting. This could be because you exhausted it, or it could be because you tried to exhaust it and somebody pulled the rest before you got through it. Either way, what I know is you started trading, you did some trading, and then there was no liquidity left at that level. That's what I'm interested in. So I'm also going to look at, so that's taking one level, I'm going to look at taking more than one level as well. So I'm going to look at, did you have to go past the first level into the second level, or, or further, to get done? Right, so how often do you have to walk the book? I'm also going to build a measure of quote fade. So quote fade gives me a sense of the inaccessibility of the display, displayed quotes. So that is, I see 10,000. I try to hit it, but by the time I try to hit that 10,000, I only get 6,000. Right, well then 4,000 faded. That's what I'm going to try and measure. So how am I going to do it? Well, I need to construct these trade streams. So what I do, I don't know who you are and what you're trying to trade, especially with your potentially anonymous market. So, I don't have IROC data, I have public data, so what do I do? Well, I find anything that happens real close together, and I say it's probably part of a smart order router spray. How close together? 30 milliseconds, if you want to know, I can tell you much more about it, but suffice to say, I'm pretty confident that these trade streams are 
or that at least if somebody sends a spinal neuron spray, I'm going to pick it up as a straight string. I may, because of the jitter in my data, aggregate two straight strings. It might be that uh, Rizwan tries to trade and Rob tries to trade and they take it together and they're both trying to, maybe they've got a correlated signal or whatever, right? They both try to trade on something. I'm sort of indifferent because what I'm interested in is if they both saw that there was 10,000 available, how much were they collectively able to take? Because anything they couldn't take faded. So I'm interested in what faded away from them that they were unable to access. So I'm going to make both fade as just like, I'm going to take these trade strings and I'm going to look at just before it, just before the first trade, and say, look across all the venues and say, how much liquidity was resting there? How much was available? Then I'm going to only consider trade strings where you exhausted all the liquidity. So that's this little jump <coughs> the right? The price was 1010. By the end of the trade string, there's nothing left at 1010. I'm only going to measure quote fade in those instances. Uh, um, and so then I'm going to say, okay, well, how much did you trade versus how much you saw? So if you traded like 8,000, but you saw 10, and there's nothing left at the end, then that means 2,000 left. So I take the one minus, it's going to give me the 2,000, it's going to tell me 20% fade. Okay. So I did this thing, I looked at orders that hit only one venue versus the orders that hit multiple venues, <coughs> trade streets, right? And here I've got the realized spread. Realized spread tells me how much I earned as a market maker, probably a high frequency market maker. I looked after instantaneous, 100 milliseconds, 5 seconds, 10, 20, 60. What you see is that if the, if the trade string only hits one venue, i.e. it's probably retail, I make money from those trades. If the trade string hits lots of venues, i.e. probably smart order out of spread, as a market maker, I lose money from those trades. So if I could, what I really want to do is to only hit the single venue trade strings and avoid the multiple venue trade strings if I could. Right? But how can I do that? Okay, let's check. So what did this feedback do? This is the quote fade, okay? So what I've done is I've, I've measured quote fade on the four largest venues, Alpha, GIX, CX2, and TSX. So what does this mean? The, the brown line down the bottom, TSX, about maybe 18, 20%. What this means is if I see 10,000 shares on TSX, usually by the time I try to trade them, I get to trade about 8,000 of them. Let's see the other, the other venues, Alpha, GIX, GIX2, they're a bit faster, typically. So they tend to have a bit higher quote fade, but you know, maybe 30%. You see what, like, I don't need fancy regression tables to show you what happened here, right? Like, it's a really big line. So, um, what you see is that on exactly the event date, like, the, the, this is a year pre-post, right? So, exactly on the event date, quote fade goes from me being able to access maybe, like, 70% of the liquidity on alpha to, like, 80% of it disappearing. So, I see 10,000. Most of the time I try to trade, 8,000 of it gets away and I catch two. It's like the fish that got away, right? Um, so, okay, quote fade. Well, this kind of makes sense, right? If you slowed me down, like I've got, got a market order that's coming in, and somebody's smart order out of spraying. They're hitting like, you know, chi X, and they deplete the liquidity there, they deplete the liquidity on TSX. Well then, yeah, they know maybe they're coming for me. It's like the proverbial canary in the coal mine, right? If the canary dies, we should probably get out of the coal mine. So, um, I did something else. What I did is to say, okay, well, you know, some guys said, maybe it's going to be removed OPR. So like, maybe just they never sent the order here, they never had a chance, right? So I said, okay, let me try just looking at any trade that happens. Unconditional on anything else that happens. Could be single trade, could be multi-trade, could take out levels, could not. Let's see what happens. So blue is trade, because it's only on alpha, right? Blue is trade, red is fade, green is stay. So if there's just a, any trade of any description, uh, you see a significant increase in the red section, right? So they start fading a lot more. But now let's think about one market clear. So like the, the MBBO of one of the markets was completely exhausted. Okay, now you see a lot less green. Right? There's a lot less staying. Alpha is fading almost all the time and trading way less. Right? I used to be trading 40% of the time when, when a whole lot cleared out. Now I trade like 15. Okay, now let's look when all of the other venues are cleared out. So if all the other venues are cleared out, how often do I trade? Like maybe 10% of the time. What do I usually do? 90% of the time I, I fade, and then like 1% of the time I still have liquidity there. Right? So for me, this was pretty like, oh, okay, cool. So like, yeah, you figured it out, good job. I think I can figure it out too. I'm not that great a programmer, but if I knew a guy, I could probably tell him what to do. So, what, what's happened? Why? What's the change here? Right? Well, what I've made is I've made a venue that's attractive for retail flow. Right? So I've inverted my market. So like if I can choose, I'm going to get paid 10 bucks by my client. I can now choose to pay to take liquidity on TSX. So I can choose to receive money for sending it to Alpha. So I'd rather send it to Alpha, but I could have sent it to Chikes 2 before. The problem with Chikes 2 is maybe you know, maybe you don't, is that they tend to just quote like one more law. So 
So if I've got a two board lot or a five board lot order, then I can't get it fully filled on CX2. But if I mandate that you have to give me five board lots, then it's a lot easier for me to make sure that it gets it done, right? So who is that going to be attracted to? Well, it's going to be attracted to retail. So let's look at who's taking liquidity and let's see if it's mostly the retail guys. So the red line is retail guys. This is the introduction of Alpha. And what you see is that it goes from being 20% of liquidity taking to about 40. And this is a really rough proxy. I'm just using the broker IDs I can see. You can see anonymous counts for like 50%, right? If it's anonymous, I don't know if it's TD or whatever. Right? Okay, let's look at who's supplying the liquidity then. If I have one to three milliseconds to get out of the way, I can't get out of the way, right? It takes me 300 milliseconds to, to blink my eyes. I cannot get out of the way as an individual. I need a machine. Who's going to be good at machine stuff? I don't know, maybe HFTs. So let's look at the HFT proportion of the provision of liquidity. This is the red line. So it used to be maybe 40, 50% of what was provided on alpha. Now it's upwards of 70, 80%. And this is just the two HFTs that I know. Like if I take CIBC's broker ID, well, it's a lot of stuff, right? So I just can't take that and call that HFT. All right, this is guys I know are only HFT. Okay, so now I can do something else. I've got these trade strings. Let me see which trade strings deplete the quote and those that don't. And let me see those trade streams which touch lots of venues or don't. Let's think about what different kinds of trades might look like. I reckon retail trades predominantly are going to be able to get done on one venue. And so they probably don't need to use a smart order router. And they're going to be a lot less likely to deplete the whole order book. Right? They're not necessarily going to take the whole level. So this would be um, undepleted, no SOR. So it's a red line. Look what happens to that fraction of, of trades on alpha. So it goes from maybe 20%, jumps immediately up to about 50, 60. Right, so it'll add about 60% of alpha's total trade volume. Let's think about what an instant trade might look like. So I'm probably going to hit lots of venues. I'm going to be more likely to take the whole level. So that would be depleted SOR. That's the brown one. So that used to account for 50% of volume, and now it accounts for like 25%. So it seems like it's a lot harder for institutional traders to access liquidity on alpha. Right? They try to access it, it goes away. I know quote fade went from like 20% to 80%. Right? So it's a lot harder for them to access liquidity. I looked at CX2 and there's no shifts, right? There's no shifts on CX2 like you see. There's no straight lines in the middle. So it's not it's not got nothing to do with inverted markets, right? This has to do with the sleep market. So then I thought, okay, well let's see how much money people are making. Right, so I look at the realized spread. The realized spread tells me, okay, you're a, you're a market maker, you buy something, you didn't really want to buy it, you want to sell it later. So I need to take some time period, time frame and assume you unwind it. So this is a way that I can measure the returns to liquidity supplies. What I'm going to expect is if I can get out of the way of those pesky multi-trade bent strings, and I can still stay in the game for those single ones, then I'm going to earn a lot more money. And that's exactly what we see. So, you know, I go from earning like, 0.1 cents on average per trade to earning like 0.4 cents. Okay, well, someone made that money from somewhere, right? So if you look at what happens on CX2, where a lot of the retail flow probably used to go, those guys lose the most, right? They see the largest, the market makers on, on CX2, they see the largest reductions on the trades on CX2. All right. So then you could think about, well, but maybe, you know, look, I've given alpha market makers the ability to reduce their annual selection. They get, they're, not, they're not interacting with these things. Maybe they, maybe they pass that back to the retail guys. Maybe they just quote tighter and they just give you a better price. Well, the thing is, right? Like, imagine that you're in a trench. Well, the trench is really safe because there's bullets coming, right? And if I'm in the trench, they're going to, like, they're going to go over my head. If I want to make the best, it's like poking my head up against a trench. I'm going to get sniped, right? So, like, I don't want to get sniped. I want to match the best. Because I need the canary in the gold mine. I need to see that everyone else in my trench got killed before me and then fall back to the next trench, right? I go back to the next, next price level. So what you see is how often is alpha at the MBBO, right? And this is the red line. They used to be there 60 to 70% of the time. As soon as it comes in, they're there like 30% of the time. They do not want to be at the best. Certainly don't want to be alone at the best, right? I'm happy you used to be with other guys at the best because I can probably get out of the way like a matador, right? So they don't quote aggressively. In fact, they quote really unaggressively. And if you look at what happens on CX2, CX2 used to be reasonable and they start quoting less aggressively too. Because guess what? All the retail got absorbed by alpha, so now CX2 has no incentive to quote aggressively because they're just going to get sniped. They keep sticking their head up and get shot. Sticking their head up and get shot, they stop sticking their head up. Right? So you start to get less 
high spreads in Canada. And this is costly, right? Spreads are basically your transaction costs. So here, I did some regressions, and so I need these to make point estimates of the impact of the thing. Right? So I look at effective spreads, realized spreads, and have a selection on alpha. What we see, at the selection, how often things move badly against me. If I can get out of the way, I think they're going to move badly against me less frequently. And that's what we see. At the end there, negative and significant, the three stars, these means like really strong. It means like there's like less than a 1% chance that you observe this by chance. Right? So like, this is very, like in my world, this means like, yeah, you found something um, the realized spread is the profit that the market makers on alpha make, right? And what would we expect there? I expect they're going to make more. Oh look, positive numbers, three stars. Okay, I can take that number and multiply by all the trading in alpha in, oh, I don't know, the last year since it was introduced. And that number is conservatively $20 million. So if I'm providing liquidity on alpha, the increase in the realized spread that I earn from avoiding adverse selection, right, is $20 million. So now you might start to think about why, as a market maker, I'm willing to pay to post, right? Because if I can earn 20 million, how about I just give 4 million back to the guy who let me avoid the nasty multi-venue streams, right? That seems like a fair deal. I'm still up 16 million, so like, why not, right? Okay. So then, you might be thinking, well, sure, that seems bad, but like maybe, you know, those market makers are making more on, on alpha, so like, they're just going to give us a better deal everywhere else. Okay, well, let's check. So, I ran my same thing for each of the venues, right? The effective spread, what you guys pay, the realized spread, what other guys earn, and the adverse selection, which is what, uh, what market makers incur as a cost. So what I would expect is that the adverse selection is going to go up everywhere. Uh, yep, goes up everywhere, three stars. Okay, makes sense. You've got less retails, you've, you've segmented the retails out, and now what you've got left is the ISO guys. Well, guess what? Retails let you hide, right? They let you hide in the forest of retail traders. If the retail traders are all over there, now you're just in like a desert, and they can see you, and they see you coming, and they know exactly how to play you. Right? So adverse selection goes up, the market makers who remain. Realize spread goes down. Realize spread goes down the most on CX2. This makes sense because that's where the retail guys used to go because it was the other inverted bit. Uh, what happens to effective spread? Well, everywhere except for Chinese 2, effective spread goes up significantly, right? So, seems like the whole market's paying more. That makes sense because you no longer have these Chinex and Alpha like sticking their head above the trench and moving to a new trench, right? They're just not willing to do it. So then you just get wider spreads. I guess you guys pay more. Um, so, we do see significant increases in depth. And if you look at Alpha's market share of debt, it goes from something like 15% to something like 30. And you might go, oh, well, look, Sean. Yeah, I know it's more expensive, but now I can trade more in size. And I, I, I tend to disagree with you simply because I showed you at the start that quote fade went from 20% to 80%. So yeah, they've increased, they've doubled their debt, but they've like less than courted your ability to access it. So even if I measure debt, it's going to be higher, but I'm not sure that it's going to be true. It's more like phantom liquidity. So I start mixing everything in a bowl, and I say, okay, well, like, what does this mean for Canada? We've got these increasing transactions costs. I've had a year. Like, what did it cost? And the answer is, like, at least 105 million. That's conservative. 100 to 200 million. Your total spread costs in the whole year are about 1.3 billion. So that's what you collectively, as a country, pay in, like, the spread. Okay? So the increase in the spread that, that you're experiencing is conservatively an increase of 100 million. And I'm pretty sure that that's coming from your pockets, and I guess they're maybe not even your pockets, they're probably just RSP pockets. Anyway, who cares? Um, okay, cool. So I think that's about all. Oh, I did one more comparison, which was just to compare um, direct mark, sorry, to compare CX2 and Alpha in the post period. So now I look at a system where they're both inverted, the only difference is the speed bump. And what I would expect is that HFT guys would do better. And it turns out, yeah, HFT, HFT DMA guys, way less at first selection, way higher realized spreads. Turns out actually anonymous is even better. So it turns out if I'm gonna rob your house, maybe I wear a balaclava. Um, <laughs> which I thought was kind of cool. And what I found very interesting was if you choose to post passive liquidity on um, alpha, it turns out you get screwed, right? Um, so it's kind of like I'm at the beach and I got my back to the beach taking a photo of my friends and they all start running away. I'm like, guys, with their ice cream, and I turn around and the tsunami smacks me in the face. Right? So if you're not fast and everyone else is, and you're left standing on alpha when everybody else left, you get hit. Right? So I mean, 
I think if you're not able to respond in one to three milliseconds, probably you should not be posting on Alpha. That's my view. Look, I'm not a trader, so I don't think So what are the implications? Well, you know, fairness for the liquidity access, randomized speed bumps. Don't let you send your postcard to Russia. I don't know how quick, how, how soon to, to send it. Floor doesn't work. So instos don't trade there, so you've just segmented retail order flow. Um, you know, we've got increases in depth, but is phantom liquidity on a lit trading venue really acceptable? Is that what you guys really want for your market? Because I, I, I don't really want it for Australia. Increase in order flow toxicity across the other venues. You've, you've stripped out the retail guys, so now it's just the insto guys who are pushing the market, and they're probably pushing in the same directions. And this is problematic. You basically allow the creation of synthetic payment for order flow. Right? Payment for order flow is illegal in every country in the world that I know of, except for the US. And I think there's a good reason for that. I think it's because it's bad for the market. And that's what I'm finding. You've allowed them to create it, and it seems bad. Um, I think the discriminatory nature of the speed bump also allows them to inst avoid institutional flow, right? If you give me a one to three millisecond head start, we've asymptoted to the speed of light. Well, if I can't get faster because of physics, I'll just make you slower, and that will still give me an advantage. So that's it, guys.